This is why Swamiji's fourth pillar of national integration is practice of practical Vedanta. Now let us come to the fifth pillar, Vedantic Socialism. Swamiji spoke of socialism that we hear of. But Swamiji is very, very clear and categorical. Swamiji says very clearly in no uncertain term, I am a socialist not because it is a perfect system, but happy loaf is better than no bread. Which is why Swamiji told the missionaries in the West that each small boy or a girl in the East is a missionary, is a philosopher by himself or herself. We don't require missionaries. If you really love India, send a few fleet of sheep full of wheat and rice because they are hungry right at this moment. This is why socialism, but then socialism is not a perfect system, Swamiji says. So what is the perfect system? Swamiji spoke of a socialism. That socialism is called Vedantic socialism. Again, coming to the same aspect that you and me are same. If you think of in personal terms, I belong to Vivekananda as much as you do. If we think of in personal terms, I am Brahman, the Supreme Being, you also are as much that. This is why there is socialism. There is absolutely no gap, no difference between man and man, woman and woman. And that is what Swamiji spoke of. And Swamiji gives a lot of importance to what you call Vedantic socialism. And then again, what we find, as Dr. Basu said, faith. He raised a very pertinent question that this is all about those who believe in the existence of Brahman or God or Allah or Bhagwan or Ishar. But what about those past millions who do not believe in God? Is a question. Now the point is. Swamiji is very clear on that point as well. Swamiji says, faith, faith in God, faith, faith, faith in yourself. So, you have three times faith in yourself and you are God yourself. You can call this some, as something else. You can substitute this term with another term. But, you are what you are. This is why self-confidence. Swamiji says there is only one word in Sanskrit which cannot be translated into English and that's Shraddha. Faith. Faith in ourselves. Swami Dibbanandaji was speaking about Nachiketa, an embodiment of faith. And that's what is necessary. If we have these six factors, if we cultivate these six factors, we are near Vivekananda as much as Vivekananda is near us. To repeat, before I wrap up, I again recapitulate to the card. Number one is, boys, I'm sure you will remember these points. If we want to attain national integration and promote nationalism in the line Swamiji thought of, to my humble understanding, it is number one, divinity of soul, number two, unity of Godhead, number three, harmony of religion, number four, practical Vedanta, number five, Vedantic socialism, number six, Faith, faith, faith in yourself, and faith, faith in God. A wonderful faith, conviction, conviction. You have come, all these boys have come here, the Culture Institute. Many of you very frequently come. 
Many of you will come whenever there is a youth convention, devotees convention. So somebody spreads a rumor. You have a great respect. You have great respect for Swamiji. You have great respect for Sri Ramakrishna. You have great respect for this institute, Institute of Culture. Somebody spreads a rumor that today, in the lunch menu, there will be beef. Would you come? You won't. There will be very, very scanty attendance. I am sure about it. The people who are known as Hindus left East Bengal, leaving everything, only for one thing. That they will not be allowed to live and practice their own faith as they, we are, they were doing so long. This is conviction. Conviction is a certain thing for which I live, I die. And this is faith proper. All these six elements constitute the bedrock of the concept of Swamiji's national integration. Swamiji's national integration doesn't speak alone of the geographical identity, alone speak of the geographical identification, speak of this integration despite the fact that Swamiji didn't ignore the pluralistic aspect of the society in our country and elsewhere. With these few words, I must uh, thank all of you, especially my brother Swami Supernananda Ji Maharaj, who have given me this excellent opportunity to be here this afternoon. And uh, I, I uh, thank uh, especially the audience who have uh, rather uh, uh, put up with me for such a long time uh, without uh, any protest. Thank you so much. With this, we come to the end of the fourth session. There is a slight change in the subsequent program. Instead of having a tea break now and then going in for the valedictory session, we'll continue with the short valedictory session and then we'll have tea and leave this place. The concluding address will be presented by Professor Sabesachi Bhattacharya. Professor Bhattacharya, please remain seated. We'll finish off with a short validity session and then we'll have the tea break. Professor Bhattacharya is the ex Vice Chancellor of Vishwa Bharati University, Shanti Niketan and he is the chairman of the Indian Council of Historical Research, New Delhi. On to Professor Bhattacharya for the concluding remarks. Should I wait until these people settle down? Those who wish to leave may do so. Yes, thank you very much. Revered eminences, and members of the Ramakrishna Order, present here, and friends. Uh, I have been given the task of uh, saying a few words in 10 minutes about the theme of the conference. You may have noticed that the theme of the conference was the relevance of Swami Vivekananda's message uh, to the 20th century. <coughs> and to address such a theme in 10 minutes is not easy. I will follow uh, the distinguished uh, secretary of the Ramakrishna Ministry of Culture, Swami Swarandaji. I will try to say in the simplest possible words, addressing myself chiefly to the younger persons, the students present here. Well, I think it's not the right forum to display one's learning, if any. Uh, my object will be just to answer this question very frankly. What do I find in Vivekananda which appears to relate directly to 
the present times. That is the subject of the conference. We broke up that into various themes. I suggested some titles which then became uh, titles of various sections and panels. But that was to break it up into small discussable subjects and topics. But as a whole, we need to look at this question, why is Vekanda relevant? And I'm very happy that I'm, I've been given the privilege to do so uh, on this day when we commemorate the 11th of August speech of Vekanandaji of, at, at the Chicago Conference. I recall that 20 years ago, yes, exactly 20 years ago in 1993, I had uh, addressed the centenary of Swami Vivekananda's Chicago um, speech. This was a huge conference held by the Ramakrishna Mission in 1993 at the indoor stadium. And at that time, I think it was Swami Lokeshananda who made this point that 11th August was the day when Swami Vivekananda gave the introductory formal speech. The real speech actually was on Hinduism on the 19th of September. However, that's a matter of detail, but it's a great pleasure for me to be here again uh, after 20 years on the same day addressing this learned audience. Now, what exactly is the reason why I stand before you to answer for myself the question, why is Swamiji's message still relevant? One reason why I think it's relevant is the obvious one, which was referred to by Swami Suhitananda and some others in the early sessions of this conference and in the beginning. And this was that there was a message of humanism uh, which Swami Vekananda brought to us, which seems increasingly relevant in this day and age when the issue of poverty is still with us. As Suhitananda Ji pointed out this morning, uh, about 70% of the population uh, can still be considered to be economically deprived. And I'm happy to note that the Ramakrishna Mission addresses themselves to that task and have accordingly used the grants that they have received. Now, the, this humanism, this, this, uh, this desire to address the problems of the uh, problem of poverty. I remember in 1993 when I spoke to the Ramakrishna Mission uh, on the occasion of the centenary celebration, I remember I mentioned this with great hesitation because in 1990 there was a kind of assumption that we are on the way to solve this problem and it would no longer be with us. If I look around today, if I look at, for instance, the book published last month by Amartya Sen and Jean Dres, uh, Uncertain Glory, an excellent book, you see that economists as well as uh, our own common sense tells us that the issue of poverty has not been resolved. Even 20 years later, it's still with us. And I always recall Swami Vivekananda's uh, impassioned address of this question. You know, for instance, that famous passage, which I think is one of the classics of the Bengali language, and he was a great stylist in Bengali. That same famous passage beginning Guliyona Hevaro. And if I if you would recall I just remember <coughs> I'll help you remember where he said Hevarot Guliona Guliona 
नीचो जाति मूर्ख दरिद्र अज्ञ मुछी मैथर तुम्हार रक्त तुम्हार भाई हे वीर सहस अवलम्बन कर सदर्पे करो भारतवासी भारतवासी हमारे भाई बल दरिद्र भारतवासी ब्राह्मण भारतवासी चंडाल भारतवासी हमारे भाई तुम्हें कटिम्र बस्त्रावृत हा सदर्पे डाकिया बोल भारतवासी हमारे भाई भारतवासी हमारे प्राण भारत कल्याण कल्याण दिस इम्पैशेंट एड्रेस I think takes us to the core of one of Swamiji's messages, which is a humanist approach. And the second thing that occurs to me as very relevant today in Swamiji's writings and speeches is what he said about the conflict between the civilization of the West and the East. Now, why is it relevant today? I think it's relevant because of globalization. So-called globalization has brought to us a culture from uh, other countries, from mainly from North America, which is of course something that uh, Vivekananda could not imagine. But Swamiji was at that time looking at the conflict between the West and the East, and you will recall how. He looked at this problem and a famous passage in Pratyo Paschato, where he said uh, about the um, West and the East that you see on the one hand a dominant West, and on the other hand we have the pull of uh, our own past at the gate. Now, who have to worry that she Paschato have. भाषा आहार परिचय और आचार अवलम्बन कर सम्पन्न प्राचीन भारत बढ़ी से मूर्ख अनुकरण द्वारा पर भाव अपना पायना अर्जन ना कर वस्तु नीचे पाए मेकिंग दिस Giving this caution, this warning, at the same time, very significantly also says, and this is also relevant to our own days, when we are overwhelmed by, I would say, not very good culture, basically. He says, on the other hand, "Tobi ki amader paschat to jawo thoi the kichu shikibar nai, amader ki cheshta jawo no kori bar kono provision nai, amra ki shompur no, amader shomaj." उंडलियन culture at the same time learn what you must and the third thing that i felt continually relevant because i taught in north india in delhi for 35 years and casteism is a very strong social force there you don't feel it so much in west bengal believe me but this casteism was castigated by Swami Vivekananda, so often in such strong terms that it's amazing that today the those who lead the uh, um, Shadow Castes and other uh, backward castes do not seem to remember him at all. They, of course, cite B. R. Ambedkar, who was a great leader and intellectual. But Swamiji also was uh, outstanding in his forthright condemnation of caste. And there's a third thing that I think is relevant to us. The fourth thing that I find very close 
to my own reading of the present day is the condemnation that he was very strong in making of the ability or the inability of the middle classes to relate themselves to the problems of the nation. We have just talked about that, national integration, and I need not go any further than what has already been said by the other speakers who preceded me. But this is one aspect of Vivekananda, which I think has been widely accepted. Finally, I would say the fifth and last point that I find very appealing standing today in the 21st century in Vivekananda's words is that he speaks to the individual in a manner no one has did to the individual in this world, a lost soul seeking a way out of the predicament, the human predicament. There's one passage in English which I'll read out to you, which was part of his 19 September 1893 speech in Chicago. Is man a tiny boat in a tempest, raised one moment on the foamy crest of a billow and dashed down into a yawning chasm the next, rolling to and fro at the mercy of good and bad actions, a powerless, helpless wreck in an ever-raging, ever-rushing, uncompromising current of cause and effect. A little moth placed under the wheel of causation which rolls on, crushing everything in its way and waits not for the widow's tears or the orphan's cry. The heart sinks at the idea, yet this is the law of nature. And then he goes on to say, is there no hope? Is there no escape? That was the cry that went up from the heart of despair. Here, I think Swamiji is almost talking of his own self, the anguish, the, 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 uh, the, the agony that he felt for his own self and for all else, for all of us. And I think he addresses here particularly a problem of our own times when the individual is increasingly isolated. Uh, and Swamiji speaks to us from his heart and talks about how man will try to find his way out of this predicament. For all these reasons, for I've just mentioned five major things that, to my mind, come to the top when one thinks what is relevant in Swami Vivekananda's message to us today. And I am, once again, I would like to thank the organizers of the conference. After 1993, after 20 years, once again, I address the members of the Ramakrishna Order on the day of the Chicago address. Thank you. I now invite Dr. Jayashree Mukherjee to express her views about the seminar. Dr. Jayashree Mukherjee is the head Department of History, Krishnagar Government College. She was the former, she is the former head Department of History, Presidency College and Presidency University. Pradyat Swami Shubhira Nandaji Maharaj, Swami Shupana Nandaji Maharaj, Swami Jaya Nandaji Maharaj, other Shamiji's and Mataji's, scholars and guests and young friends. We are celebrating with great pomp and solemnity the 150th birth anniversary of Swami Vivekananda, one of the most influential thinkers and makers of modern India. This national seminar funded by the central government 
at the Ramakrishna Mission Institute of Culture is a part of these grand celebrations organized by the Belur Mott in honor of Swamiji. First, I sincerely convey my respectful gratitude to the organizers of this seminar for giving me a chance to say a few words on Swamiji and share my ideas with you. The very title and dates of the seminar are significant. The title is Swami Vivekananda's relevance in meeting the challenges of the 21st century. The day 11 September is indeed a red letter day in the life of Swami Vivekananda in the history of the Ramakrishna Vivekananda movement and also in the history of our freedom struggle. It was the day when Swamiji in 1893 at the World Parliament of Religions Chicago addressed the audience as sisters and brothers of America and delivered his first speech. He raised high the flag of Vedanta and the flag of India. Contemporary newspapers and reports show that he was the chief crowd puller. The Chicago success forced him to stay for more than three years in the West, spreading the message of Vedanta as explained by his guru, Sri Ramakrishna. Back home, Hundreds of our freedom fighters of different shades of opinions drew immense inspiration from Shamiji's Chicago success in their fight against British colonialism. This inspiration indeed continues, but ironically, to the men of the 21st century, 11th September has also become a nightmare after the ghastly terrorist attacks in the USA in 2001. Men are searching for love and peace, unity and compassion in a world honeycombed by political, economic, religious and ethnic challenges. Shamiji's message of love and harmony, unity and peace, integration and assimilation have become thus much more meaningful and relevant today than it was 100 or 125 or 150 years back. Born and brought up in a cultured family of North Calcutta and transformed into Swami Vivekananda by the magnetic inspiration of Sri Ramakrishna, Narendra Dotto had a multifaceted personality he was a saint, seer, scholar, reformer, patriot, philosopher, athlete, musician, all rolled into one. He was a humanist and also an individualist, a nationalist and also an internationalist. Though a self-sacrificing monk with a firm belief in religion and morality, Vivekananda was never blind to the material aspects of human life that is education, economy, politics, physical development, cultural attainment, so on and so forth. He knew India was beset with grave problems like poverty, illiteracy, ill health, malnutrition, caste system, superstitions, and so on. He knew it very well that there was not only the problem of colonial oppression, there was also the problem of oppression from within the Indian society. Oppression of the rich and the strong over the poor and the weak. To resolve these problems, he pleaded for education and health, peace and harmony, material progress and spiritual growth. With the passage of time, new problems have been added. Though the world has become a global village with high-tech facilities and super-first transportation, though the world has witnessed tremendous development in physical and biological sciences, new challenges have nullified much of this advancement. The 21st century world is reeling under the pressure of globalization, privatization, terrorism, fundamentalism, 
apartheid problems, maldistribution of wealth, naked consumerism, ruthless corruption, etc. Added to these are the problems of broken home, child exploitation, sexual harassment, and most importantly, physical and mental loneliness. To combat all these challenges, Shamiji's messages are the panacea if they are properly studied, understood, and applied. We have been listening during these two days to many lectures. Many of these lectures have been very illuminative and fascinating. Yesterday, it started with the chanting of Vedic hymns. The Secretary Maharaj Swami Subarnanandaji felicitated the speakers of the inaugural session and extended a hearty welcome to dignitaries and delegates. Many of them have taken the trouble to come from far off places to attend this seminar. As the convener of this cultural subcommittee, Swami Balabhadrananda talked about the importance of this seminar. And in the e-note address, Swami Shuhita Nandaji Maharaj, the General Secretary of the Ramakrishna Mott and Ramakrishna Mission, emphasized how Shamiji's words and ideas can be used to solve the multidimensional problems of the 21st century. Taking cue from Samaj's man-making ideal, the Ramakrishna mission is striving to propagate value-based education among our people, particularly among the children, the youths, and women. The vote of thanks in the inaugural session was extended by Professor A.K. Sharma. The second day, that is today, the 11th September, this seminar had four academic sessions on broad themes closely related to Shamiji's ideas. The themes were well delineated, highlighting the quintessence of the message of the Ramakrishna Vivekananda movement. Taking cue from his master Vivekananda spread to the world the eternal values of the Vedanta, the Sanatan Dharma, taking great pains initially without support and money, Vivekananda propagated these lofty ideals of Vedanta in the West in a bid to earn money for his very poor countrymen. He cherished the dream that dialogues and discussions among the leaders of different religions could resolve many of our modern day problems. Shamiji endeavored to bring Vedanta to our practical life and put stress on the synthesis of yogas. Gana, Karma, Bhakti, and Raja Yoga. His ideas of yoga found warm response in the West during his lifetime, and this appreciation has increased many times in other parts of the world as the days have rolled on. Thematically, no discussion on Vivekananda can be complete without his concept of national integration. He was the man who literally traveled throughout India, saw hills and rivers, flora and fauna, and personally experienced the joys and sufferings of the people of our country. He met the princes and fakirs, rich and poor, educated and illiterate, conservatives and progressives, men and women. He developed in his mind the concept of national unity and in unambiguous terms spread this message that the poor, the ignorant, the lower classes are all our brothers and sisters. He also pointed out that our teeming millions as well as the women should be given proper education. They should be given back their lost personality, lost individuality and after getting education, these common people and the women would decide, would themselves decide their own future. In the valedictory session, the concluding address was delivered by Professor Sabasati Bhattacharya, an eminent historian and former Vice Chancellor, Vishu Bharati University and Chairman ICHR. 
Not only the seminar thematically has been well worked out, it has also been very, the entire seminar has also been very well managed and organized. And indeed, it is a very happy experience to have a seminar like this in a beautiful building at Ramakrishna Mission Institute of Culture. We may conclude with the words of our hero, expansion is life, contraction is death. Strength is life, weakness is death. 150 years after his birth, we should take, sincerely take resolution that we should try to translate some of his ideas into practice as much as possible. We should take our inspiration from his firmness and boldness, from his dedication and feeling for others. Arise, awake, and stop not till the goal is reached, may be our motto. Namaskar. Now, may that Swami Supernandi Maharaj will give his expected views. So, dear brothers, I have one thing to say to you, and I am now going to speak <coughs> special request by Professor Rotterdam, Shubhadeva Rotterdam. I didn't have any. So mind to stand before you once again at this fag end of the session. Now you have been listening to one idea constantly and you have to listen to it as long as you are students. Each soul potentially divine, divinity of all life, so divinity, divinity, divinity. And you listen to some of the speakers this afternoon that the atheists, those who are Nastikos, they don't have faith in the divinity of all life. I tell you, you also do not accept this view, though you are not all Nastikos or atheists. You are all students. You have faith in God. But Swamiji is constantly speaking to us that you are all divine beings. And since I had the opportunity to say, say guide students like you for long, for eight years or so at Narendra I know what is your reaction. To divinity, 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 morality, you always say, but we don't feel, but we don't have any affection to religious life. Religious life we understand. But divinity, divinity, why do you say, why do you say so much about that divinity, divinity, divinity? I tell you brothers and young sisters, the student sisters, that this divinity of all life is central to Swamiji's teaching. This is not only the central teaching of Swamiji. This is central to his teachings. Whatever he taught and whatever you see in the pages of his volumes, this is, this is, this is nothing but the extension of elaboration of this single concept. All life is defined. I tell you. If you are not divine, what are you then after? Can you tell me? Can you answer this question? If you are not divine, so the atheist, so the nastikos, nastik jara tar kore na jara amra divine. Kine tomra jara nastik no, tomra jara kono amde pobe. The divine, divine, ei kotha na kano pobe. Ami to amde bolii. If you are not divine, what are you after all? Can you tell me? Can you answer me? If you are not divine, you are opposite. Opposite of this divinity is what? Cruelty. If you are not divine, you are cruel. Would you accept that epithet? Would you? 
would you answer me? You are never cruel. If you are not cruel, you are different. Remember this. तुम्हारा जिन्हें देवता के विश्वास ना करो बोला हमारे देवता नहीं आते हैं ना सब बोलते हैं ताहरे आमिर जी बोली जिन्हें तुम्हारा तेरे की क्रूएल छटे की तुम्हारे को क्यों भालू एक ता विशेष हम इस जिसे गुड एडजेक्टिव वुड यू एक्सेप्ट दैट नॉट सिंगल नॉट इवन एन एथेइस्ट वुड एक्सेप्� Never stop, never. <coughs> Forget this concept. You are all divine beings, and everybody else is divine. Because in deep sleep, you are one with your divine nature. There is no body, there is no mind. You don't feel what you are with. You are not with body, you are not with mind. You cannot remember anything when you sleep well. In sleep you are not dead. You are one with your divine nature. Everybody else is like that. And that's why divinity is our mother. Divinity is our nature. Our Bhumate Jai, Bhumai Bhule, divinity Sange, our divine nature Sange, act Sange Bhule, our Pagul Hui. Bhumate Na Pagul Hui. Pagul Hui. We have to be with our divine nature, our nature, for some hours. Otherwise, we would have developed insanity. That is it. Remember it. Accept it. Like anything. This is the most important concept. You are all divine. I welcome you all yesterday, and I bid farewell to you all. Thank you. Namaste. With pronouns to Thakur Ma Swamiji, pronouns to the Revered Monks present here, my respects to the learned speakers, and my love to all delegates and students present here. Today, all of us have been diving deep into the sea called Vivekananda. The program, which has started with a note of hope, has ended with a sense of accomplishment and triumph. I thank all the speakers who had shared their views with us today. I thank all the delegates and students who have participated in the seminar. I thank the staff of the Department of Indology and Research. I thank the staff of the Maintenance Department. I thank all volunteers who had helped in conducting this seminar. Ultimately, my sense of gratitude to the all-merciful Lord due to whose blessings this seminar has become, has become a grand success. Thank you all of you. Arrangements have been made for tea and snacks. Please have them before leaving. Thank you.